my name is Nigel Topping. I'm the High Level Climate Action Champion for uh, COP26, and I'll be joined very shortly by my colleague in Gonzalo Munoz, who's the High Level Champion for COP25. And it's it's a real pleasure to be um, the host for this dialogue. I'd like to welcome everybody wherever you are in the world joining us. Um, I'd like to thank in particular our great partners, the Global Resilient Partnership and the Adrienne Arsh Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center and the Global Center on Adaptation for coming together in a spirit of radical collaboration to set up tonight's dialogue. Um, we've got a simple objective tonight and that's to get your ideas on um, how we in our role as high level champions for the COP process can design and launch um, what we plan to call a, a race to resilience campaign, or we'd like to assist a campaign to the already launched and, and, and with great momentum race to zero campaign so that we can figure out how to help um, all of those great initiatives which are already out there mobilizing non-state actors, which is the, the term the UN uses to refer to businesses, investors, cities, states and regions and, and other organizations in civil society, how we can design and launch a campaign to really scale up momentum uh, to make a difference to the lives of the billions of people living in vulnerable situations, vulnerable to the impact of climate change. Um, our, our job as high level champions, our mandate is to raise ambition. So we sometimes joke that our job is to add zeros to people's targets or take decades off them. So what you heard me right, I said billions, not millions. That, that's our mandate to be ambitious. Um, and we think it's really appropriate given the scale of the challenges that we face. And in fact, um, one of the really important parts of this dialoguing process is to make sure we're hearing from all the different voices around these challenges. We think, Gonzalo and I, very strongly that it is simply not morally right to allow the predictions of the impacts of climate change to come true. The predictions that 100 million more people could be pushed into extreme poverty by 2030, of course, exacerbated by the COVID combined health and economic crisis, um, that uh, up to 130 more million people could be pushed into um, near famine conditions. We think it's unacceptable to let the number of people who lack sufficient water, um, uh, who lack access to clean water and sanitation, which of course is crucial in the face of climate um, emergencies, to raise to 5 billion by the year 2050. We think it's unacceptable for millions of people in coastal and, 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 and river communities to be at risk of being driven from their homes. And there are a host of other things which are not acceptable. So this really has to be a decade of delivery, a decade of action, not just on mitigation, but on resilience. And we feel we're very clear that it's not an either or. We, we must take action on mitigation because mitigation in a sense is the first line of defense for resilience, but we also have to adapt to create resilient lives. So we need the race to zero to succeed and we need to design and launch and ensure that the race for resilience succeeds as well. Um, it's, resilience has been a recurring theme through, throughout the race to zero dialogues these two weeks. In fact, um, thanks to, to David and Jorge's work with many partners, we've, we've seen resilience woven into um, at least 30 of the dialogues out of 98 in these two weeks. Um, and Gonzalo and I have been really impressed on the content um, of those dialogues we've been able to join. And, and I, I just want to reiterate that we, we very consciously use the word dialogue because we're really inviting ourselves and everybody to listen to different perspectives in a spirit of respectful listening from which can come learning rather than trying to protect or project one right view. We've already been able to join four regional resilience dialogues in Southeast Asia, South Asia, Africa and Latin America. We've got more to come in the new year in other regions including the Pacific and the Caribbean. Um, and those regional dialogues and the dialogues these two weeks have given us some real insights into the priorities for action on resilience. It's been crucial for me because I don't come from a background working on resilience. I've been really focused in my work on climate in the last 15 years. On, on really industry and mitigation. So I'm on a steep learning curve. Um, uh, but I'm going to hand over to Gonzalo now um, because my WhatsApp message tells me that he's joined. Here he is, great, the technology <laughs> works. To share the priorities and the messages um, from the resilience dialogues we've had so far. So Gonzalo, great to see you, my friend, and over to you. 
Thanks so much, Nigel. And uh, Anuel, you're absolutely right. It is absolutely a moral imperative to take action to build the resilience of people in developing countries, uh, especially people living in less developed countries in small and developing states. We're suffering here in Latin America from this hurricane beating in the coast of uh, Colombia. Absolutely uh, never ne never happened before. And, and who are the, the ones that are suffering the consequences? Sure, some tourists that, that had the uh, holidays canceled in Cartagena, but the rest, all of them are uh, are people that are the most vulnerable, let's say that the ones that have best responsibility on creating a crisis like the one they're living. So they are the ones not only less responsible for causing the, the crisis, but yet are the ones most impacted by climate change. We, we have to continue repeating that, but still not enough. Probably we have, we have to do that much more because it's not fair, it's not just, uh, it's time to change it, definitely. And, and we as champions, acknowledge that most of our work, most of the climate work has positioned the effort towards mitigation. It's time for resilience. It's time for creating the best communicational tools, uh, the best implemental tools, the best financial tools uh, to be aligned towards the resilience that we require urgently. And in that sense, the dialogues have been extremely rich. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's quite challenging, you can imagine, to summarize them. So, uh, of course, I'm going to try, but my friend and brother here will help me uh, if, I, if I make any mistake. So, please, uh, let, let me go through it, but, but Nigel, please, please interrupt me if I, if I say anything wrong. Uh, so, there, there are three sets of messages and idea in general, right? The first message is urgency to act now. Right uh, and, and 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 acknowledging, as I said before, that we have lost quite a lot, quite a lot of, of the required time. The dialogue definitely demonstrated that we cannot continue to see mitigation and adaptation as separate. They must be combined to tackle the current and future impacts of climate change. Uh, there's no uh, or; it's an end, and that's something that we have been speaking about very concretely and putting a lot of effort on that. Most of the efforts to, to tackle climate change have up until now focused on emissions reduction, but climate change has already affected millions of people all over the world and will impact on billions without immediate investment and action on resilience. This needs to change. And, and of course, that is something that, that uh, if, if you contrast that with our capacity of reacting and mobilizing uh, and, and in my, in, amazing amount of money due to COVID that, that is required. I'm not saying not do that, but it shows that we have that capability. It's something that we're not understanding that needs to change, right? Uh, they also, the, the dialogues also highlighted the importance of building urban and rural resilience to improve the lives of people living in slums and to transform our food and agriculture system and the lives of smallholder farmers. And again, if you connect that to the recovery plans due to COVID, there's a huge opportunity on using the, that money that is changing or creating jobs, many times related to transforming cities or creating new infrastructure or uh, creating opportunities on greening cities or uh, definitely on nature-based solutions, then you just have to match those two criteria. This also means uh, breaking silos. For example, working with nature to build into our food and water system. Uh, the second big message is put people and communities at the center of action. If we are not to leave no one behind, we must give local voices, including women, youth, and marginalized groups, the agency and legitimacy to design and deliver solutions. And, and I would reinforce something that we've heard a lot, women, women, women. Like, like every time it's so much related to women being the ones that suffered most of the consequences, women have the capacity of mobilizing much faster and sometimes much more effectively. The possibility of educating girls as one of the most important things that we can do in order to, to tackle climate change. So uh, there's a lot about, uh, of course, not only putting people in the center, but sometimes we can also do something else by double clicking on that. This is what uh, we heard loud and clear from the regional um, re resilience dialogues and race to zero dialogues. When communities are empowered, they deliver. Something uh, I have seen with my own work with uh, way speakers in Latin America, where again, uh, have to say it, 
uh, women way speakers were much better than uh, men. Underpinning this, um, uh, underpinning this, we need to trans uh, transform financial mechanism with people at the center uh, of the solutions. Uh, we also need innovation from businesses and civil society. I am quite biased as a business person and a farmer, but innovations are led by non-state actors, non uh, and, and from, from non-governmental uh, uh, stakeholders. Governments uh, are crucial as enablers, but not natural innovators. I know that, and but that means that we have to create the public, part, uh, the private public uh, partnerships in order to uh, set the conditions for the private sector to innovate, and then for the the governments, the public sector, to help that to scale. Third big message. Yes, Gonzalo, just, just 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 one thought to add. I think. Um, you know, we've heard a lot about the the kind of asymmetry in terms of, um, but you know, vulnerable communities often being, you know, are, are, you know, the poorer communities, marginalised communities, um, and sometimes sometimes the narrative, um, I, I think, oversimplifies to say that that's in, that's only a global south problem, when when we have marginalised communities and vulnerable communities in in every country in the world. Um, so I think it's just. It's, it's just something I noticed. It's, a, it's, a, it's one of those narrative traps we have to avoid falling into. Is you know we mustn't forget that as as we've learned under COVID that um, you know, they're most vulnerable to climate change in every community, um, including in in LA and in and in the UK. Um, uh, are, are communities we need to consider when we talk about um, resilience. Yeah, and 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 something that also resonated. I remember one of the dialogues that. Uh, what means vulnerable to climate change? Because it's not only about whether you are living whatever in a coastal zone, but it's about uh, you, you live in a resort and, uh, and but you're very wealthy. Sure, you are vulnerable to climate change, but the focus should be in those that are not only vulnerable but also are poor. Are I mean have a lot of necessities, right? So so there's something about about that that is important in terms of managing the the language. Absolutely agree. So third big message, reimagine and increase investment into resilience, including under COVID recovery uh, programs, as I mentioned. The dialogues uh, highlighted very well why we need to increase public and private investment into climate resilience at the local level, both to manage the risk of climate change. Uh, we, we heard also about the importance of, um, of the need of flexible funding mechanisms to adapt to uh, local priorities. Um, this holds the opportunity to invest in a more prosperous and resilient future in a 1.5 degree world. Again, um, an opportunity that we, we will miss if COVID-19 recovery packages don't prioritize adaptation and mitigation. We, we should not miss the, uh, the, the amazing and unique opportunity that, uh, that this uh, unique or unprecedented crisis uh, is offering. So COVID, despite the devastating impact of, on, on people's life, uh, does present us with a once in a lifetime chance to help create this transformation on the social and economic uh, uh, system we need for a safe and prosperous future. So uh, Nigel and I are so determined to play our part in achieving this transformation by mobilizing action on non-state actors. Remember that that's, part, that's a role uh, but we are absolutely committed to do so and the Race to Zero and our plan Race for Resilient campaign. Uh, I am now, of course, um, looking forward to what our speakers thoughts on, on our plans for Race for Resilient, uh, to make a difference to billions of people's lives. Uh, and, and it's, uh, I mean, it's, as I said, it's our moral duty uh, to mobilize the best effort that we can. We have 12 months ahead working together, and then Nigel continue another 12 months, but you can count on us on really willing to create a big uh, momentum for resilience, uh, uh, having heard from so many people uh, in the ground, how urgent all, is, all, all, all of this is.